Influencers is a Christian marketplace ministry focused on encouraging all whom we meet to join us on a journey of growing in a personal, intimate, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ through community. Our Tuesday table mentoring sessions are an extension of our missional response to grow in an intimate fellowship with God through the empowerment of His Holy Spirit and His enablement of His living Word, the Bible, in our lives. We welcome a multitude of Christian leaders to speak on a number of topics at these conversations. We realize that some of what is expressed by the speakers may not align with our ministry beliefs and or God's word. We provide this disclaimer to encourage you to take all that is shared here back to the Lord and his holy word, which is inerrant, so that your life may be built on God and his word alone. All righty, Pastor Wendell, it is a pleasure to have you rejoin us. It's yours. Welcome. Thank you. Well, that's the first time I've had a disclaimer put out before I gave a talk. <laughs> so that's awesome, um, especially in light of the topic you guys gave me about uh, the role of the church and uh, the government, because I tend to uh, uh, get myself in trouble occasionally uh, here locally uh, on that subject matter. But um, thanks for having me, and thanks, guys and gals, for being here in the room today. Um, I want to turn to a couple of passages, and if you have your device, if you could turn to, or your Bibles, turn to Matthew 16, and I just want to read a passage from Matthew 16, and then Isaiah 58 will close with. Um, I, I want to go on record and say I'm thankful for our government leaders here in our community um, we're blessed with some wonderful people, God-fearing people, and uh, it's our honor as a church and for me to serve them in any way that we can. Um, I think as it relates to the church sometimes, you know, there's always that debate over the role of church and state. Um, I think, you know, in our country, if you look at the founding of our country, certainly the idea of separation of church and state has more to do with the church not, um, I'm sorry, the state not dictating to people what they would believe and how they would worship, uh, and less to do with whether the church actually has influence on society or on government itself. In fact, I think, you know, scripture is pretty clear that as believers, we're called first to be citizens of heaven and ambassadors of Christ. And that means sometimes the role of the church in society is that of uh, the conscience of a society that speaks up and speaks out on important moral issues of the day. We live in a tough time because so many of the moral issues of our day have been politicized. And so sometimes it sounds um, off when churches talk about moral issues that are actually uh, in the current you know, debate politically. But scripture gives us permission to talk about hard things. And I want to read a passage from Matthew chapter 16, because I think it's uh, germane to what we're talking about today. And it's uh, when Jesus took his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi. And I want to just uh, set the context for you uh, just um, for a moment. When Jesus takes his disciples um, to Caesarea Philippi and says the words he says to them, um, he's taking them way out of the way. You know, we read over this passage and sometimes don't recognize the uh, geographical context of what Jesus was doing and where he was. Um, Caesarea Philippi is on the northern tip of uh, the Sea of Galilee, kind of up in the Golan Heights. I was just there a few days ago with about 100 pastors, and I was teaching on this passage there. Um, Caesarea Philippi was way out of the way, especially if you don't have cars to drive to Caesarea Philippi. It's 25 miles from really the religious center around the Sea of Galilee, which would have been in Tiberias there, uh, Magdala or Capernaum, would have been where the synagogues were. Those were kind of the religious center for that region. Much of Jesus' ministry, as you know, took place around the Sea of Galilee. Most of his ministry took place there. He is nearing the end of his ministry time and getting very close to um, moving toward Jerusalem and toward the Gethsemane and the betrayal and, you know, the, the trial and the crucifixion and all that would happen during Passion Week. And he takes his disciples from 
uh, really the epicenter around the Sea of Galilee, the religious epicenter there by Tiberius. And he takes them on a 25 mile journey up to Caesarea Philippi. And that, that's a major trip um, for uh, his, him and his disciples to take. So it was a long ways away from um, where they would have been doing business for the most part. Um, not only that, it was really the region that was the pagan worship region uh, in the north, in northern Israel. By that, I mean, uh, in Caesarea Philippi is where, if you study, have studied at all pagan worship, it's where all the bell worship took place up there in the Old Testament. It later on became a place where uh, a temple was built to uh, the Greek god of mythology, Pan, that was very sensual, very, if you uh, just, you know, Google uh, Pan or the god of Pan, you'll see that it was very sensual and very dark, the worship to this god of Pan. In fact, interestingly enough, it's where we get the word panic from, is from this god, because it was very evil, it was very dark, very pagan. Jesus is taking his disciples up into this region, and he's taking them up there, um, out of the way, a long ways away, and really to the bad part of town. It would almost be like if we were graduating kids out of, or, you know, students out of, young people out of some um, Bible study thing, or maybe a, a seminary class, or uh, they were getting ready to be deputized, and we took them to the seediest part of town. Uh, it would be like that. Jesus was taking these, you know, his disciples all the way up, kind of at the end of his ministry, to Caesarea Philippi to make the declaration that he makes to them there. And the backdrop for this declaration is this massive temple to this Greek god. It's actually carved out of stone. You can Google it, look it up, and see it to this day. It's, car it's a grotto carved out of this massive stone that is at the base of Mount Hermon. And that stonework that was in the, the whole platform of worship that they had there was very sensual, very uh, uh, evil, very dark, very sexual. And um, he takes them up there really to the darkest place in that region and gives them their commencement speech. So this is kind of a commencement speech. And I, I want to read it to you. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I am, that I the son of man am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah and others, Jeremiah are one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to them, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, and this is really the key verse here, that you are Peter, and on this rock, the rock of Peter's confession, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. I want you really to look at verse 18. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I love this verse. I love the context of this passage. Because when Jesus says upon this rock, he's obviously talking about uh, his lordship, him being this, uh, you know, God, the son, the savior of the world, that he is the chief cornerstone that the church of Jesus Christ is being built on. And he's standing in front of this massive rock, you know, temple to this pagan God. That's the backdrop. It is this massive rock behind him, it just towers over uh, Caesarea Philippi, and it's in the background. They're all seeing that, and he's saying to them, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And um, he takes them to the darkest area. I mean, the darkest area in the whole region, the, 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 the area where everything that was off limits was done, where the most vile and pagan uh, expressions of sensuality and, 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 and pagan worship were done. And he says to them, I'm building my church upon this rock in contrast to that rock and the gates of hell 
we know that gates are defensive, right? To keep people out shall not prevail against the church that I'm building. In other words, the church that I am building is going to be able to go right up to the gates of hell. It's interesting that if you study the God of Pan and Greek mythology, they actually call that grotto the gates of hell. They saw that as being, because it's a massive hole in this mountain, they saw it as being the place where the demonic came in and out of uh, hell. And so they call that the gates of hell. So all of his language here is very much important to the context that he has them in. And he's saying, you can, you can count on this. I'm building the church. It's being built on me, the chief cornerstone. And I'm giving the church authority. I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. I'm giving you the authority to bind and to loose. And I'm telling you that the gates of hell cannot keep you back. It cannot keep you, the church, out. That you have my permission, my power, my authority to walk right up to the gates of hell and snatch people out of darkness. <laughs> and he's making this massive declaration to these graduates. I want you to go forth in power, and I don't want you to be intimidated by what, I don't care what you see. I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care how hurting and broken people are. I don't care how lost they are, how deceived they are, how addicted they are, how hurting they are. I am commissioning you to go right up to the gates of hell and you have the authority and you have the power to do the work of Jesus in those settings. And that just is incredibly important to me, especially as I think about the role of government and the role of the church. We are in the business of seeing people snatched out of the gates of hell. We are in the business of seeing broken people who have lost all hope or have been completely robbed of their sensibilities about right and wrong come into the glorious light of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we have taken, I believe, um, the, the, the responsibility that the Lord has put on the church to proclaim the gospel and to minister to people at their point of need. And we've tried to transfer that on the government. And then when the government's programs don't work, we say, you know what, they're doing a lousy job, vote them out, let's get somebody else in. And it is this vicious cycle that just repeats over and yeah. over and over again. Let me tell you that the government is power, powerless to actually change people because the government can't tell people the truth. By nature of the government, they do not have the ability to proclaim the gospel. It is to the church alone that the gospel has been entrusted, and it is the good news. It is the hope of every man, woman, boy, or girl that is hurting or broken in our society. And so the church has this amazing commission and opportunity to go in and meet people at their point of need, proclaim the gospel, and as we love them and serve them, to see their lives change and transform. So when you talk about the role of government and the church, they're just two different roles. Our role very much is as the church of Jesus Christ. If you read the words of the prophets, if you read Jesus, you watch Jesus' ministry, especially Matthew 25, read that. And what you'll see is that much of what we think the government should be doing is really the role of the church. The church has been to call to advocate for people who can't to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. The church, Isaiah says this, uh, you know, when Jesus went into Nazareth and he opened the scrolls of Isaiah to begin to read about the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to set the, the captive free, to, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring healing and hope to those who have lost all hope. This is the job of the church, and the church needs to move from just criticizing government and saying, why aren't they doing more, to just acknowledging we've been called to do that work. We've been called to be the people who both minister in word and in deed. You know, the early church, the reason it was powerful is because they had the proclamation part down. They were preaching the gospel, but they were also ministering to people at their point of need. And it takes both. It takes word and deed. And so I believe that the church, we are citizens of heaven, ambassadors of Christ. We have a responsibility to serve our community and also serve the, our, our government, really. When we do good things and serve with the gospel message and helping people in our communities, it's a blessing to our government. And actually, Good leaders will see that and respond to that and be blessed by that. 
So I think, you know, God is doing something in the earth right now. I think he's raising up his church and he's calling us to be people that aren't just about only proclamation, but we're about proclamation and we're about serving people in need. I want to shift to Isaiah 58 because I just want to read a passage from Isaiah 58 that kind of exemplifies what Jesus talks about. And we don't have time today, but when you're talking about Matthew 25, many of the things we think of that the government should be doing, the government, you know, and all the programs of the government, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything negative about anything the government does today because I, I get in trouble every time I do that. But at best, it is a band-aid. Because it is the truth that sets people free. You shall hear the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that ultimately brings freedom to people. doesn't matter if they're hungry or addicted or all those things. They need to be cared for and served at their point of need. But they also need to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as citizens of heaven, as ambassadors of Christ, we come into hurting civilization. We come into a hurting community. And I've said before, it's kind of like um, on your body. If you have a wound on your body, God's created your body so that all the white blood cells move toward that infection to bring healing. The church, we should become specialists at moving toward the brokenness of our city, moving toward the darkest places in our city. You know, I think about there's a, a, a revival coming in a couple of weeks downtown. The parking lot of the revival where we're setting up the tent and, and all the churches that are going in to get is right next door to the deja vu strip club. And you know, when they first told me that's where we're putting up the tent, I thought, really? That's going to be interesting. And then I thought, I drove by there today and I saw up the sign. I'm like, perfect. That's actually perfect. That represents really exactly what Jesus was talking about here, that we go where the pain is. We go where people are hurting. We go where people have lost hope. We go where people who have given up, and we say, we're not interested in just a Band-Aid. We want to care for you. We want to minister to your need, but we are going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ because we are gospel people. And Isaiah 58, if you read the prophets, if you read the words of Jesus through this lens, G scripture, the prophets, much of the writings of the prophets are about justice. They're about speaking up for people who ha don't have a voice, about caring for the marginalized. And as we do that, we earn the right to be heard. As we care for people at their point of need, we earn the right to be heard. And they listen to, me, to us in a different way. That's what scripture says in Romans 2, 4, that it is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. It is the kindness of the Lord. And when the church operates and the kindness of the Lord in the context of their community, hearts are open. Scripture says that a man's gift makes a place for him. That as you care for people, the hearts of people are opened up and they listen in a different way. And this is what Isaiah is talking about. And when Isaiah writes, he's talking, God through Isaiah, the prophet, is saying, look, this, these are the, this is the kind of church I'm going to bless. I'm going to bless a church that cares about hurting people. And Isaiah, I, we don't have time. You should read the whole chapter. But I'll just read beginning at verse 10. It says, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the, afflict, the afflicted soul, Isaiah 58, 10, then your light shall sh sh dawn in darkness, and your darkness shall be as the noonday. If a church is caring for and serving their community by caring for hurting people, Jesus says your influence is expanded. Your The light becomes brighter and more pronounced. Number, verse 11, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul and drop and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. In other words, God's saying, if you care about the people that I care about, the people in your community that are hurting, and quit saying that's the government's job when you see a, a person that is hurting. Quit saying that. That's our job. That's part of who we are as Jesus people. God says through his prophet, he said, if you will be that kind of church, that kind of people, and he's talking to Israel here, he says, I will bless you. And I will cause you to be strong. And I will cause you to be like a well-watered garden. And your waters will not fill. In other words, God's saying, I will provide everything you need to do everything I've called you to do. This is a real need for the church across the nation right now. We need the Lord's blessing upon us. We need the Lord's blessing. And the Lord's blessing is promised to us if we will extend our care to people in our community that are hurting. 
Verse 12, those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of st streets to dwell in. The church should be known in our community as people who are restoring those that are hurting to wholeness, people that are restoring those that everyone has given up on back to life through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through the love and the compassion of Jesus Christ. So I just challenge you. I challenge you to quit criticizing your government and start blessing them and praying for them. I challenge you to quit um, thinking of all the things the government's not doing right and focus on, you know, doing our part as the church of Jesus Christ, because much of what we assume the government should do, we should probably actually be doing. In early American history, the church was at the center of education. In early uh, history, if you took the, just the hospital system of America has been largely launched by the church. And it's only been in our lifetime, the church has pulled back and pulled away from much of that delivery of care and compassion in a community context. The church, the church is God's infrastructure across this country for the healing of our nation. It is. There's a church in almost every neighborhood. The church does the best with people that are addicted. The church does the best with people that are hurting and hungry and, and, and suffering. The church has the answer because the church has the gospel. We've been entrusted with the gospel. So let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for my friends today. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in your church around uh, our nation, across our nation, around the globe. I thank you, Lord, because these are important days, important days for your church to serve uh, with passion, hurting people. And Lord, I know this. I know that as we serve them, the, their hearts will open up to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I, I pray that you'll help us to be people who lead with what we're for. Hallelujah. Yeah. That we, God, uh, instead of focus on all the things that we're against, help us to focus on what we're for. We're for people being set free. We're for people coming to Jesus. We're for people being restored to that that you have for them, their destiny and your hand upon their life. We pray that in Jesus' name and we thank you for it. Amen and amen. I just want to say, I just got back from Ukraine and you know, the government there, their 100% attention right now is on the war. This is my fourth time in Ukraine in the, since the war broke out. The Church of Jesus Christ, we're networked with 1,800 churches there and serving those 1,800 churches to serve their communities. The Church of Jesus Christ in Ukraine is seeing revival wow. because the church is meeting the needs of the community. The church is the one providing the care. They're providing the safe houses. They're providing food. They're providing the generators for people's homes. They're helping people get back on their feet during this terrible, terrible war. They're doing the, the, the counseling and the care and the prayer in their neighborhoods and in their cities. And I just want to tell you that, you know, when we think about the role of the church, we've minimized the role of the church. We've let it be diminished in our culture. Let's move back into the center of our communities, and let's be who God's called us to be. Thank you. Thank you. Woo!